attracted my attention, man. You had me stuck for about four or five hours, man. I love your content. Uh, this is New York City Crime Spot. Go ahead and introduce yourself, G. Hey, thanks a lot, Jamil. I appreciate you having me on, man. Um, yeah, I run a YouTube channel called New York City Crime Spot. Um, born in New York City, uh, mostly lived in Queens uh, most of my life, and I've been doing content on YouTube for almost three years now. Okay. And uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. What, what actually influenced you or triggered you to um, cover, you know, to, to do investigative journalism on organized crime figures? The fact that you're right. from Queens or what? What, what triggered yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, first I'll say, I mean, I, I definitely do a lot of organized crime, but I have a lot of non-organized crime stuff. Um, generally, New York City crime, I don't know. There was something about, you know, those stories, you know, since I'm a kid teenager watching documentaries um i always say old school hbo like late 90s early 2000s hbo you know a lot of gritty right. documentaries um a lot of gritty tv shows so i kind of grew up watching that stuff and i uh yeah that's how i got into it man what was one of your first pieces that actually got some traction online uh it's thanks for asking because it's actually a non-organized crime story. It's a story called the Wendy's massacre, which occurred in Queens, uh, in May 24th, the year 2000, the same day 50 cent got shot in Jamaica. Right. <clears throat> Fun fact was the Wendy's massacre, which happened in Flushing Queens. Okay. I yeah. seem like I, I heard of that story before. Was that, was, was some people killed in a freezer or some shit like that? Yeah, so it was a former disgruntled worker who was into a lot of other bad shit, and he kind of got another guy to, to do this job with him. Unfortunately, the guy that he got to do it was um, probably not, you know, unfortunately all there upstairs. So he kind of convinced this guy to take part in what was supposed to be a robbery. And it basically turned into a, a mass murder incident where, forgive me, it's been a while, but I believe five people lost their lives and seven in total were shot. So there was two survivors. What was the actual motive behind that? You said just, just a disgruntled employee came back to settle the score or something like that. That's it, man. Just a disgruntled employee. Um, there was nothing. I mean, you know, it's, it was, it's sad, man, because these are people he would, he used to work with and then he ended yeah. up. Murdered. So it, there was really nothing aside from him trying to just probably rob an establishment yeah. And getting caught up in the moment and doing something despicable, you know, unfortunately. Was it, any, was it any survivors? Two survivors. Yeah. One gentleman by the name of Jaquan Johnson. And there was another guy. Forgive me. I forget his name. But, right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, out of uh, all of your stories, which, which one has turned into the most high profile? The most high profile? Yeah. Like on my channel, you mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, to be honest, that the Wendy's one is the, the my one. most viewed. It's the most viewed video, um, which I like because it's not organized crime. Yeah. So it kind of brought in. It was one of the ones I did early because it was missing from YouTube. A lot of these stories are missing. Right. So you got to find these things that you remember happening and you go on YouTube. And if that story is not there, well, then, you know, I kind of try to put it there, you know, put it out yeah. there. What's some of the... Um you know, resources you use to put together your stories and shit? Yeah, good question. So it's a mix. It's a mix of, I would say, things like this. Those are FBI files. That's actually Stacks FBI files. Um, okay. Shout out to my man Steve at Novice Historian who did that Stacks video with me who, who originally obtained these files. So um, FBI files, um, court records, news archives, of course, books. Cool. Um, once in a while, you, you know, you start doing these videos and you get people who grew up in these neighborhoods reaching out, telling you stories, you know, that's kind of the coolest part about it, you know? Right. Um, right. So yeah, I would say those are kind of the things, the main sources. How does, how does somebody, how does somebody retrieve F FBI files? Is that Pacer.com or something like that? No. So yeah, so Pacer's cool for sure. You can get your federal, uh, files there, but FBI files, you have to put in a request with the FBI on the website. It's called, uh, you know, the FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act. Okay. Um, now you'll be surprised a lot of the times on the FBI website, or if you ever go to archive.org, you'd be surprised how many FBI files are already available for you to look through. Um, yeah. but unfortunately sometimes you got to request them and it could take 
six months. It could take a year. It could take three years. You know, the way these people move, they don't really care what you want, you know? Right. What type of reception have you been getting from this story about Stax? <laughs> oh, it's been amazing, man. It's been amazing. And you know what? The most amazing is you posting it on your on your Instagram because it shows me that it's hitting on something. And, you know, he's an interesting character. He was a very interesting character. And, of course, you probably know you don't really get a lot of um, black associates of Italian organized crime. I mean, you get them in power positions, you know, working with Italian organized crime, but not a guy who's like specifically an associate, yeah. you know, of, of organized crime. And who's, you know, it's just a very, he was a very interesting character, very interesting okay. man. For everybody that's watching the gentleman that we talking about stacks, um, he was depicted in the movie Goodfellas. He was Samuel Jackson and he was the one responsible for disposing of the, the vehicle from the Latanza, it was an airport heist, right? Yeah, the Latanza cargo terminal. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, tell me how you ended up uncovering all of this good shit, man. Because yeah, before yeah. you, before you, he was just like a footnote in organized crime history. And, you know, yeah. the fellas was a, um, it was a motion picture. Right. And a lot of times Hollywood just makes shit up. But I have heard, um, I have heard mobsters online say that of all of the films that was made about organized crime, yeah, Goodfellas was kind of authentic. What you have to say about that? I would agree. Yeah, I think I think of course you know I wasn't around to see it, but I would think that's pretty pretty authentic. Um, but I would say they might have even painted the guys a little better. You know, when you start looking into who the guys were that took part in that heist and what they were into. Um, they probably were painted a little more glamorous in Goodfellas. Okay. I would say that, yeah. And what you said before, Stax is a footnote, right? Yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate that, like you said, they make shit up for movies or whatever. So you never really get the full story, even though I love Martin Scorsese. I mean, obviously that movie is still a little bit Hollywoodified, if you if you want to call it, you know. And yeah. what we take away from that is what? Stax is a dope, right? That's what it seemed like. Dummy, yeah, right. did some stupid shit, got himself killed. Right. He's just a dope. Right. But he's more than that. Right. So what happened was I had dinner. I did a video where, you know, a lot of what I do in my channel is I go to where these things happened. Um, like you, you travel a lot, right? You go to meet people. You interview. Yeah. So absolutely. So that was one of the routes I took when I was going to start this channel was I wasn't just going to sit behind my computer and talk to people. I was going to go on the streets in these neighborhoods, you know, in Canarsie and Flatlands and South Ozone Park and just film where these events actually took place in real life. You know? Okay. So I did a video where I went to the block on East 95th Street in Brooklyn where Stax actually left the van in real life, which is kind of bordering on like Brownsville. And then I went to his apartment um, where actually he lost his life in South Ozone Park. So after that, gentleman by the name of Steve from Novice Historian hit me up and he's like, I like what you're doing. Hey, have you ever heard about this? And he presented me with some of the Ali stuff. Okay. Um, so for those listening, you know, Stack, Stephen Stack, his name is Stephen Stack, Stephen Stack Edwards. During Muhammad Ali Frazier won the fight of the century. He was Muhammad Ali's bodyguard, mm. you know? Um, so Jamil, the only thing we had to go off of after all these years of mafia photos being online is the mugshot of Stax. That's it. From 1974. Yeah. Right. Right. So basically, you know, we couldn't just go by some of the news articles, even though it made a lot of sense. Right. We right. just had to keep looking through press conferences and photos from that time. And then we hit on the guy that look just like the guy in the mugshot, right? Right. Was it was it easy to find him? Because you got some pretty accurate depictions of him. Was it easy yeah. to spot him? It was pretty easy, man. Once I found um, one of the press conferences where he's sitting behind Ali and he's got like this long sleeve Navy shirt on. Right. And I'm like, wow, if that's not the guy in the mugshot, I mean, I don't know who is. I mean, it's got to right. be. Right. And after that, if you watch the Stacks video, there's a guy by the name of Rick DeMeo who emailed me and he's like, I love the Stacks video you did. 
by the way, I grew up on the block. I knew Stax as a kid. He lived on, you know, he had the same apartment on my block and I showed him the Stax footage and he was like, wow, that is, he, he was blown away. He couldn't believe it. He was like, I never knew this, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. was his, was, you said, you know, he grew up on the block. You just said Rick grew up with him. Did Stax kind of grow up in an Italian neighborhood? Was it a mixed neighborhood? How did he become associates with these guys? Right. So he's born in 1947. He's born in Manhattan. Um, his early life, I think he has a 10th grade education. So he's out of school by 10th grade, basically. From there, it's kind of fuzzy when, when he makes his way into Queens, into Ozone Park and all of these areas where he gets hooked up with the Lucchese's. Um, that is still a little bit fuzzy. I mean, that might take, you know, talking to a family member sometime to really get that part of his life down. But right. By the 1970s, I could say for sure, probably by the late 60s, 70s, he was probably living in his own park, I would say, in Queens. Yeah. Yeah. Based on history, a lot of a lot of black guys and Italian mobsters develop relationships in federal prison and shit like that. That wasn't the case with Stax, was it? No, no, no. Um, he wasn't a guy who spent many years in prison. Um he would get arrested here and there. I think he did like a two or three year bid. You know, he was really involved in like credit card fraud. So he, they would bust him with stolen credit cards. You know, he's got bribery charges, you know, um, obstruction of justice, stuff like that. But there's no evidence that he spent any significant stretch of time in prison right. at all. Um, right. There is also... He would, now, he was also a talented musician. I don't know if anyone knows that. This is something that Henry Hill did speak about a little bit, but he was a talented musician. He was in a, he had a group called Grand Central at one point. So he was like rock and roll, blues. He was, you know, so so we're seeing, we're building the character. You know, he's not a dope, right? Right. He's not, you know, the, the down and out idiot. You know, there's a lot more to this guy, right? Um. So what were you saying as far as like him getting hooked up with uh, those guys or? Yeah. How did, how did, did you ever pinpoint how he got hooked up with them guys? Because they, he had to be trusted to be affiliated with them for them to trust him to dispose of the vehicle. So did you ever pinpoint his history with these guys? Because they're not just, just going to call a guy right. and say, yo, we need you to do this. They, he did some right. shit with them before that. Right, yeah. So here's the basic history of many of those guys. So in Ozone Park, at that time, when you look at those guys who were there, they were all kind of doing the same thing, right? They were fencing stolen goods out of JFK, hijacking trucks, and basically this stuff was being passed around the neighborhood, right? So Stax, as Rick talks about in the upload, he was known as like the cigarette guy. He would always have stolen cigarettes from, you know, stolen off the trucks or JFK, so these guys are in the same area and they're kind of doing the same thing, right? Okay. So as far as we can tell, at least in the late 60s, he was already with these guys. He would have already been hanging around Henry Hill's uh, suite lounge on Queens Boulevard, running credit card scams, trying to fence any stolen things he can with these guys. Um, right. There's also an incident where, um, you know, Paul Vario? I've He's, heard of him. Yeah, so that's the Paulie character in Goodfellas. They call him Paul Cicero. Oh, got yeah. It. So there's a point in, I believe, 73 where his son Leonard Vario dies, right? It's a whole suspicious way. He gets burned to 90% of his body, and they just throw this guy off at the hospital. They don't really know what happened, right? And then during the funeral, actually, Stax gets arrested um, because he starts fighting with the reporters. He actually punches a detective in the balls and he gets arrested at the funeral of Leonard Vario. So he was a guy who was a knock around guy who they did trust to hang out with them, who definitely yeah. was, like I said, it's not common to have a true like black associate of organized crime, but by all measures, he was definitely um, a Lucchese crime family associate because of who he was affiliated with. Paulie Vario, Tommy D. Simone. Jimmy Burke, he was affiliated with all those guys. Right. I was, um, I don't know how I felt about seeing him with Muhammad Ali. I'm, I'm, my middle name is Ali. I was named after Muhammad oh, nice. Ali, actually. And 
he, Muhammad Ali got a, a history and he has a lot of pictures with high profile gangsters. <laughs> yeah. There's a picture of him in, um, well, it's well known that he had a relationship with Major Cox and he lived near him in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, outside of Philadelphia. Yeah. He was one of the, he was like a black mafia associate. And there's a picture of him with a guy by the name of Nudie Mims. Okay. He was one of the more high profile members of the Philadelphia Black Mafia. And now you got this thing with Stax. Did you ever, you know, figure out how him and Muhammad Ali ended up developing a relationship? You see, that's a that's another thing that we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out how that came up came uh, about. Um I have my own ideas. Like it could have been that it could have been that he was maybe doing some bodyguard work for one of these like mob clubs that might have been some kind of celebrity hangout. Um Maybe he, he stood out for some reason. Right. Might, he might have been spotted in that way. Of course, there's always like whispers of maybe somebody connected in the mob got him in there. Of course, that's. Yeah. Somebody also asked me if, if maybe he was connected to the Nation of Islam or something, but I I haven't found any proof of that. Whatsoever. That's why that that's that that's why they they probably asked you that because the 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 guy that I was telling you about Nudie Mims from the Black Mafia. Yeah. They were. A part of the Nation of Islam, I think it was Temple Twelve or Philadelphia. Yeah, so I haven't found any evidence of that. I mean, even in the FBI files, I mean, I'm sure. Listen, they're not always like they don't always have everything, but I'm sure that it would say something like that if he was known to, because you know how the feds, especially at that time, you know how they would have looked at the Nation of Islam, I and mean, if they would have found out that some NOI guys hanging out with the Lucchese, I mean, it would have been something that they reported. I would, I would think. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. All right. Uh, Stax, he didn't really look intimidating or anything like that. What do, what do, what do you think of uh, his qualifications? Do you think it was something that he probably did to convince Ali that he was – or was it just his size? He was a pretty big dude, right? Yeah, so he was reported to be around 6 feet but around 285 pounds. So – when you look at him, you could see obviously six feet is it's a good size, but it's not like super tall, you know. Um, but you can see he's very like wide, you know. He's got like wide shoulders. He's like a he's got a presence about him, right? And yeah. even in the newspaper reports of the time, every time they would speak about him, they would speak about him in a way where he was like this force that was guarding Ali, and he's clearing the crowds, and they were even interviewing him. So there was something about him that even the press thought was very interesting right. whether it was the way he acted the way he looked um the guy rick who lived him on the block referred to him as very affable he said he would smile all the time you know his size was maybe intimidating but his personality and his demeanor was not um so i don't know there he, he must have had some kind of charismatic quality about him that's the only thing i could think of you know he had a lot of charisma or what are the kids called now riz that's what they call right, it. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so he was he was the original Riz Master, maybe. Do you um can you give my my viewers give them a little bit of history on the Latanza heist? Yeah, yeah. So the if any of you guys seen Goodfellas, of course, I mean that's based on the Latanza heist. Um, a lot of what's in that movie is loosely kind of based on the book Wise Guy, which is Nicholas Pileggi and Henry Hill. Um, of course, Henry Hill is an informant. Uh, some people would say rat, whatever you want to call it. Um, so there is some there is some questions about his full story. You know, right? He was definitely an associate. He definitely right. did a lot of a lot of shit. But his role in the actual heist is, in my opinion, almost non-existent. Yeah. Um, so that's basically Goodfellas. But yeah, so December eleventh, uh, nineteen seventy-eight. Of course, they go into the Lufthansa cargo uh, terminal. And this all starts from a tip from a guy by the name of Lewis Werner, who was actually working at the Lufthansa, who was a degenerate gambler in it with the loan sharks, basically. Right. And he actually two years prior to the Lufthansa, ice, he had already started stealing money out of the Lufthansa terminal. He stole some foreign about twenty five thousand dollars in foreign currency and he was kind of working a little bit with this other guy that worked there by the name of Peter Grunewald. 
so this originally comes from a Lufthansa employee, and then it makes its way basically to the Jimmy Burke crew. Okay. Um, basically, because bookies and you know loan sharks and whoever he's into to money for, you know, eventually it flows into trying to assemble a team to do this ultimate score, which would also help him too because he's in it for his own issues, you know. What did they take? So it's reported at the time about five million in cash and over a million in jewels. Oh my goodness. Some people estimate it to be even higher. It could be as much as seven, eight million, because you gotta understand, like a lot of that stuff has never even been recovered. Um, so they don't really know. And there's so many different stories about where this stuff ended up, where this jewelry ended up. Right. Um, some people say certain family members of guys involved still actually have some of that stuff. If you if you're in the mob genre, you might know who I'm talking. I don't want to say, but there's definitely names out there that people believe that maybe family members still hold possession of certain things that might have been taken that night. Okay. For this to be um, the inspiration for a motion picture, obviously yeah. somebody had to do some telling, right? Of course. Who told it? <laughs> who told it? Of good fellas? Yeah. Well, like, who well, told this? Like, some for them to make the movie, one of those guys that was in that in the house, right. he flipped, right? Well, Ray, well, yeah, so what happens is Lewis Werner is the only guy that ever gets convicted of the heist. None of those guys ever get convicted. So the guy in the Lufthansa, he's the only one that ever gets convicted. And he's ratted out by the his co-worker, Peter Grunwald, who also works at the Lufthansa. Okay. So so he's kind of the main witness. And there's another guy by name, uh, Fischetti, who's also involved with them, too. Um, so as far as how it kind of came about. Some of it comes from that guy, Peter Grunewald. Some of it comes from Henry Hill, Ray Liotta's character in Goodfellas. Okay. Um, and of course, there's always some informants and rats out there that we'll, we'll, we'll probably never know. But when you look at the, di the dynamics of, um, cause it's a very specific crew who kind of really went in there and did it like Jimmy Burke, uh, Joe Pesci, Tommy D. Simone's character. Yeah. Uh, guys like Angelo Seppi, Robert McMahon was another guy involved who actually worked for Air France, who took place in the Air France robbery in 68 or 69, I think, when Henry Hill, Tommy D. Simone, and Robert McMahon, they robbed Air France for uh, millions. And no, not millions. I think it was about a half a million they robbed Air France for. So that was one of the guys that also was involved in the Lufthansa heist. Another airline employee. Um, but a lot of these guys, like Robert McMahon, like he worked in the airlines, right? Air France. Mm -hmm. But he was also like involved in hijacking trucks. And um, all these guys were involved in the same shit, Jamil. Like they're all kind of doing the same thing. This seems like this was like a popular crime to do back then. Was this something that was was often uh, a, a crime that organized crime figures pursued? Of course. Air, and then airport. Especially, yeah. Airport heist, yeah, hijacking trucks. I mean, especially in that area, Ozone Park. Yeah. Uh, um, even like South Jamaica, Ozone Park, Howard Beach. You know, you're right by JFK Airport. And at the time, these guys, you know, they ran that shit. And, you know, they would sometimes be in cahoots with some of the truck drivers. Sometimes they would hijack the truck and take the guy's ID and tell him, I know where you live, so you better not say anything, you know? They would do stuff like that all the time. Right. Um, that was kind of their bread and butter. I mean, I think you kind of get an idea of that in Goodfellas, you know, with the furs and all the stolen shit and the cigarettes. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that's kind of true. I mean, that's pretty much reality for them. Why was there so much money at the airport? Because the shit that you're saying now, it seemed like, they probably still got a lot of money at the airport. Was it being transported somewhere or something yeah. like that? Yeah. So according to Peter Grunwald, who was the ultimate, uh, one of the witnesses, um, Lewis Werner, who's the guy that kind of hatched the scheme and kind of put, put people onto it, he's responsible for kind of dispatching money out of there, right? And the Brinks trucks would pick it up, and then they would they would go deliver it to Chase Manhattan Bank or whatever it may be, you know? Um now, according to Grunwald, uh, what Werner does is they come to transport this money. He knows this delivery is coming, and 
Werner pulls some shit where it's like, oh, you guys can't take a load out of here because I don't have a security guard or supervisor on hand to do this. Yeah. So those guys end up waiting around for a while. Eventually they leave, right? So the money is still there. I think this happens on the 8th or the 9th, and the money's still there on the 11th. So there's a lot of things that go into it, you know, all the inner workings yeah. of why that money was there. Um. But yeah, like you said, you know, they made off with it. They uh, went in there, stuck everybody up about five. That's another thing, uh, Jamil. We kind of know the names of the people who went in there. And then there's kind of still questions lingering exactly, you know, if there was one or two other guys. Some guys are interchangeable, you know, as far as who really went in there that day. Yeah. Um, But yeah, they made off with it. And as you guys see, Goodfellas, a lot of them ended up dead after. I mean, that's very true. Was this money coming from the Federal Reserve or some shit like that? Because you no, said the Brinks truck was picking them up, picking it up, and taking it to the banks and shit like that. Like, where right. did the money come from? Where did it originally come from? Yeah. Um. You know what? To be honest, I'd have to look back. I don't know if I recall exactly why the money was coming in there, but but shit like that would happen all the time. That was the same thing with like I spoke about the Air France, like. You know, it was kind of different back then, too, with ex- with accessibility to airports. Yeah. Like I was talking to this guy, Rick, who who worked around the airport, who grew up there. And he said he used to just ride his bike right into the terminal. Like he would just be able to just go in there. Like people would just be freely able to move around these areas, you know, like back then. So yeah. lack of cameras, too. Um, a lot of shit goes into it. Got it. In the movie, wasn't Stax found in the trunk of a car? No, he's he's murdered in his apartment um, by Joe Pesci and the the, the Carbone character. Um, okay. You know, when he says, like, when he's got the coffee in his hand or whatever, and he's like, put the coffee down, they just, then they leave. Um, yeah, he's murdered in his apartment. In in the movie, they, they actually kind of... Um, Pretty much real, yeah. What they show, that's pretty much what happened to him. Okay. Yeah. And what year? Yeah. What year was he killed? He was killed about six days after the heist in '78. Damn. I believe. Uh, I believe he was killed on the 16th, and the heist was on December 11th. Yeah. So he was he was killed pretty quick. Yeah. The identity of or the parties of people responsible for his death did that ever come out in any other federal investigations and yeah. trials or shit like that yeah it's um it's widely accepted that it was tommy d, d. simone and a gentleman by the name of angelo sepe who is now tommy d simone goes missing soon after that also he ends yeah. up disappearing joe pesci's character um and it's suspected that angelo sepe probably was involved in most of the murders of the people that disappeared after that a large portion of them yeah got it got it he gets murdered later on not related to the Lufthansa heist okay yeah. to this day to this day how much did you say how much did you say that they took though so it's reported to be a little over five million in cash and over a million in jewels yeah and it could be higher than that it could be higher who knows you know it could be seven right. eight million yeah how long was he with Muhammad Ali so interesting, yeah. So he was only with Ali for Frazier, uh, Ali won. Fight of the century. Just that, that, just that fight. And that, uh, that was in 71, right? Yeah, that's it. And he was killed what year? He was killed in 78. Okay, seven years later. And after Got that, it. you know, if you look at him in the Ali footage, he looks healthy, strong, he's good. You look at his 1974 mugshot, you can tell he's living on... He's living rough, you know. He's not. Yeah. He's not at a good place. Damn. So when you um once you got um the information that he he was a bodyguard for Stacks, you just went on on YouTube and start uh, pulling up old Muhammad Ali fights and footage and shit like that. Yeah. So it was that, and then it was looking at any photos I could find from the 1971 press tour. Okay. Yeah. And even if you watch when Muhammad Ali comes into the ring for that fight, you even see stacks with him, which I didn't show, which I didn't show in the upload that we did because it's kind of a lot. But if you, if anybody wants to watch it, um, watch the whole entrance, the whole thing, you'll see stacks in there for sure. That's wild as hell. That's wild yeah, as man. hell. Yeah, man. 
it's awesome to to be able to talk about it and to and to be able to like um kind of put some personality into and some character behind this guy you know instead of just like you know in the end what does it matter right but you know it's just cool to know that somebody who was a footnote in history somebody who's in a prolific movie was more than the dope that left the van you know what i'm saying he had a you know, I would even argue that he probably had a more interesting life than many of the guys that were even involved in the Lufthansa heist. I mean, most of them were, yeah, sure, they had families and stuff, but most of them were just career criminals, you know? Um, yeah. You no, know, none of them were Muhammad Ali's bodyguard, you know? None of them were, you know, talented musicians who played in bands and seemingly people liked, you know? What was he performing at? What was his band rocking out at? Well, it would be like you go like Henry Hills, The Suite, um, Jimmy Burke's Roberts Lounge on Lefferts Boulevard, probably just local bars, local um, local mob spots or rock and roll clubs, you know, stuff like that. Nothing right. serious, probably, you know, just like local guys. Do you feel that he was killed out of being reckless or they killed him to silence him, period, for, for having knowledge of the crime? Yeah, so I don't, I don't think it would have mattered. I think they would have killed him anyway. I do you know? too. <laughs> they would have killed him anyway. You know, I mean, it didn't help that you know he, you know, he enabled them to find that van, you know, on East Ninety Fifth Street over there. But he would have been, he would have been killed anyway. I mean, come on, you know. Yeah. So after um, the heist, you said only only one guy ended up going to jail from that shit. Only one person was ever convicted for taking part in the Lufthansa heist. Shit. Sounds like they did pretty good. Sounds yeah. like they well, did. Yeah. Well, most of them ended up murdered. Uh, Jimmy Burke, Robert De Niro's character, ended up going uh, to prison for life anyway for a murder. Um, and what else? Tommy DeSimone, Joe Pesci's character, murdered. Um, Angelo Sepe, who I spoke about, who was probably one of the shooters of Stax, he gets killed in, I believe, 1984 in his apartment with his 19-year-old girlfriend who also gets murdered. Damn. Um, that, you know, that was another thing about the mob, uh, Jamil, like Italian organized crime, like sometimes people speak a little romantic about it, you know, but the fact is that there's a lot of bad things, especially around that time that were done, like I could name three, four, five, six different incidents of women being killed, teenage teenage women being killed, um, you know, collateral damage, stuff like that. And right. it certainly happened. And, you know, it's the more you look into this stuff, the more, you know, you take kind of the romance out of it, you know? Yeah. These robberies, this robbery fencing type of circuit, ain't that something that John Gotti was involved in early in his career? Of course, yeah. Same pedigree, man. All these guys, same pedigree. I mean, they all came out of the same area. Um, so they're all kind of in the same thing. Um, actually, Robert McMahon, who I mentioned, uh, who was on the Lufthansa heist, who ends up getting murdered, he he's he was with, you know, doing stuff with some of those guys, too. He was arrested with, um, I don't know if you've heard of a guy by the name of Charles Carniglia. He was a gaudy guy. He's reputed to be, you know, one of the main shooters on the Castellano hit, you know, when they killed uh, Castellano at Spark Steakhouse. Um, right. Big in heroin trafficking. Um, so those guys were even arrested together back in the day, you know. So there's also crossover with a lot of these guys, you know, in that area being involved in the same things. Yeah. You know? So Gotti was from Queens, too? He is originally born, I believe Gotti is originally, I think he's born in the Bronx originally, if I'm not mistaken, but somebody could probably correct me that, but basically his, you know, it's Ozone Park, East New York. That's kind of where those guys make a name for themselves. Right. They were known as like the Fulton Rockaway boys. That's kind of what they were known as early on. Okay. The it's a lot, right? It's a lot. <laughs> yes. It did. Yeah. I, I I was glued to the screen. The guy that you interviewed, what was that gentleman's name again? Uh, the older gentleman or the first one? The older gentleman. The one yeah. that had all of the good stories about Queens. I think it was. Right, right. DeMeo yeah, that was or Rick something DeMeo. like that. Yeah, Rick. Rick DeMeo. Rick DeMeo. 
Yeah. And what is it, it? Does he do? Um, does he do investigative journalism too? No, no. He's just like, you know, he grew up in Ozone Park, so like he'll be on YouTube looking for like Ozone Park shit, you know, or looking at like mob stuff. And he just found my yeah. channel. And um, he's actually a uh, a professor. He's actually like a college professor or something. So, so he's a really smart dude, and um, he just liked what I did, and it was that Stax video he saw, and you know. Just the idea that I went to his old block and I was filming his neighborhood. He was like, wow, you know? Yeah. And as you said, he had stacked stories, you know? Okay. One thing about this this online community, when you put out something dope like that, people be expecting more. So what you expect to do as a follow-up, because this is a big one. I don't think nobody ever put any ID on stacks. Like I said, he was a... No. Footnote in this whole organized crime shit. Right, so right, right. now that you got everybody's attention, where do you where do you take this shit from here? Yeah, well, once again, you know, thanks to my man Steve, novice historian, who you know, to be honest, we we've kind of been holding on to this for for months, many months, just trying to see how we could put it out. Like we, we we've known about this for a while, and we kind of put everything together, and then I finally got Rick on board to come on too to add some more context. To be honest, man, like, I think the dude should have a movie. Like, there should be a movie about him. To be honest, like, I think, like, I don't say that as, like, a joke. Like, I really think that that would make, like, like an interesting piece of cinema, you know? Right. I'm going to warn you, everything that you discovered, they're going to steal it. You know that, hey, right? yeah. You know. <laughs> I know, I know how it is. <laughs> They're gonna steal it, man. They're gonna steal it. Um, when I came across your story, I was sitting there watching it, and my girl was a couple feet away. And I think I left the room, and you might have said something during your dialogue, like, "If anybody see this, make sure y'all give me y'all credit. <laughs> give me yeah. my credit." Because well, you know, you know how it is, man. You when I went this. to go post it and shit, she was like, "Yo, you better get that dude his credit too," and that's how. I <laughs> That's how I found you. Yeah, That's how yeah. I found you on yeah. Instagram. I was gonna admit, I was gonna just say, I just seen this because I do this often. I was gonna say I seen this dope story and I show I shared the information. And I was gonna say, you know, it, it, who it belonged to, but you actually had an Instagram page with more stories, and I was able to find you and shit. So tell yeah. people where your IG page is at so they can come check out some of the content yeah. you got on IG. Yes, NYC underscore crime underscore spot. So NYC crime spot, but you got to like separate them with the with the underscore thing, you know? Right. Um, yeah, speaking about stealing, I mean, I'm sure you know about that stuff. I mean, you've been doing content for a while, man. You do you do good work. And um, in the community that I'm in, like when I talk a lot about organized crime, like we'll find a picture or we'll put up something rare and like 10 minutes later, it's on Reddit. Somebody pretending yeah. like, oh shit, look what I got. And they're it's like, happened wow. to me. Wow, Happy nice find, me. bro. Nice find. And it's like, dude, like, I'm not... What I said in that upload is, like, like, let's say an archaeologist finds, like, something in the Egyptian desert, right? He didn't carve that piece of gold, but he found it, so he's going to get credit for finding the damn thing, right? But he knows right. he didn't create it, right? So that's a problem that I find on when you make content that people are very hesitant to, like, just shout you out. Just be like, yo, check out this channel. This guy drop this thing you know yeah yeah that, I've, I've um came up with some rare pictures from dc i was i was dominating dc's um you know they or, organized crime or underground underworld right. so to speak and i came across some pictures that's never been seen before and i see people doing content to this day with pictures that yeah. i came pictures that was given to me directly from participants and shit yeah and, yeah they made it right, made it around the room, and nobody gives me my credit. So I don't want anything like that to continue to happen to me. So I brought you here so they can Thank see. You. you know what I'm saying? Uh, some people in my comments they asking uh, about the name of the channel on YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah, NYC Crime Spot. I think I think at this point, I mean, obviously I'm still trying to grow the channel, but I think at this point, if you just type in NYC Crime, I think my channel comes up. Right. So that's kind of cool, I guess. But um, yeah, and uh, it's it's been fun, man. It's been fun, you know, just to talk to interesting people like yourself and right. just have these conversations. How many subscribers you got over there right now? 
So I've been doing this for two years, nine months, I think. So I'm at, I'm almost at 25,000 subs. Okay. Almost. Uh, I can't, when you really look at it overall, I can't complain. You know, that's not bad in the grand scheme of things, you know, but yeah. I definitely sometimes feel like I wish I had some more. <laughs> well, after this interview right here, I'm pretty sure a lot of these people in my chat will go over there and check you out. Make sure you have some dope for them, man. Because oh, yeah, yeah, really, yeah. Yeah. Um, Please, guys, if you, if you don't mind, you know, sub to my channel. Watch some yeah, of my yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, Everybody here, New York City Crime Spot. Make yeah. sure y'all go over there and subscribe. He got some dope stories over there. Um, predominantly, is your stuff centered in Queens, or do you go throughout the five boroughs covering organized crime? No, five boroughs, I'll do all types of stuff. I mean, Brooklyn, I filmed in Brooklyn, Staten Island. I just did something in the Bronx, Queens. Yeah, so I'll go, I'll go you know, pretty much anywhere all over the city. Sometimes I'll even go to Long Island, you know? I'll do something out on Long Island. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I'll basically go anywhere. I mean, and I try to do uh, other stuff, you know, outside of organized crime, too, you know? When you was in Staten Island, where you was at? Todd Hill? No, I was in, um, you know, where is this? I don't even know. I, w I was basically in a, in a deserted area, kind of a desolate area of Staten Island, walking through some weeds and some marshland where at one time there was bodies with maybe like seven or eight bodies buried there. So I kind of went there to show people, you know, what these mafia dumping grounds kind of looked like. So I was just walking in there and right. that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you don't feel like you uncovering or digging up any bones when you're going. Through oh, no, 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 no. The feds already <laughs> found them. The feds got them. <laughs> I'm sure there's more out there. Unfortunately, I mean, some of these places in New York, man, I mean, you know, they're sitting on mafia burial grounds, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Brett, I appreciate your time, man. We gave him 42 minutes. That's all I wanted to uh, come here and highlight the situation with Stax because that's something that has never been mentioned. The pictures are rare. You got yeah. very clear, good, good pictures of him. And um, I think that, you know, you and your channel should be highlighted for that. For those who yeah. haven't seen... Um, a picture of stacks outside of the mug shot that everybody is familiar with. There's a picture of him and Muhammad Ali on my page on Instagram at I am gully TV. And you could go from there and go to my man, Brett page and see what he's doing over there on Instagram. Make sure y'all give him a follow. Yeah. Brett, you've been wonderful, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. If you come up with any more dope, I'll be back to see you. I appreciate Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, you know, cause when you do YouTube, sometimes you get in like a little echo chamber and I'm in, I'm in the mob genre. And, but, you know, it's really nice for somebody outside of that genre to reach out and, you know, help me get the, the story of this character out there. So I really appreciate you, you yeah. having me on, man. It means That's a lot. what happens when you come with originality. You Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. A lot of people try to piggyback. And it's nothing like being a pioneer. And you was the first to touch, um, touch this subject in, in such a manner. So... Again, thank, thank you. you, man, and uh, I'll be in touch, all right? Uh, I appreciate you, bro. Thank I appreciate you. Appreciate you, too. Have a good one. Yeah, peace. peace.